Hey YouTube, what's up? If you don't know, I'm Jesse, and today's video is gonna be a bit nerdier of a topic than normal. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really talk much about 808s here, so the title is a tiny bit of a lie. I just like the alliteration and the pop culture reference. But I did think it would be really interesting to do a video regarding the phenomena of muzzle flow. If you guys haven't seen the guys over at Ballistic High Speed, go check them out. They have some really phenomenal videos. I definitely think they've gained a lot of traction, so good things to look at. But they don't really come with much of an explanation as to what's going on within those videos. So I pulled up this one video here, the projectile is leaving the muzzle. But it's actually a much more nuanced event than you might think. So make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. I do try to cover all sorts of topics. So if this one's not up your alley, go check out the channel anyway. There's all sorts of different types of videos. Something might suit your fancy. So muzzle flash actually has five distinct components to it. We can break this phenomenon down into pre-flash, which is gonna be caused by the blow-by primary flash, which is gonna be caused by any still burning propellant solids or gases after the projectile has exited the muzzle. The muzzle glow, which is gonna be observed by gas on the inside of the shock bottle, which is a word that I'm gonna go on to describe later on in the video. I don't wanna to get too much into that now. Intermediate flash, which is gonna be the result of any gases that have managed to sneak past the normal shock of muzzle gas ejection. That one's definitely more dependent on the type of caliber you're shooting, if you're gonna see it or not. And then lastly, the secondary flash, which is gonna be caused by the reaction of your combustion products as they're able to enter and react with the air. The mechanisms that allow them to work are still being studied, still being understood. We know in a generalized system, right, that the projectile is gonna move down the barrel it's gonna compress the air ahead of it as it's doing this motion. The barrel itself is going to in turn act like a shock tube and allow that near planar shock to form. As that shock exits the muzzle, you're gonna get that initial spherical precursor shock. Really cool phenomena. But as the projectile moves faster, if the velocity is low enough, yes, correct, low enough, then you'll actually be able to see a secondary precursor shock occur. And this one's gonna be able to move faster than the first because of the medium it's moving through. So the first one has to go through the air, through the natural ambient surroundings. The second one gets to move into that higher density fluid that's bound by the first. We know things like barrel wear occur, bore swelling, but because we can anticipate all of those things, propellants are actually usually under oxidized which is what's gonna create that initial pre-flash. So you see all of that gas blow by and it's gonna be able to combine with the oxygen in those early flow fields. And at high enough temperatures, they'll react. So just after all of that precursor shock occurs, but before the projectile is actually able to get out, we're able to observe what's referred to as the Mach cone or the shock bottle, which I had mentioned before. So you can kind of see in this picture here, I put a little drawing, that tiny little section right before it's much more dense is that mock cone event. This phenomenon is referred to as the shock barrel and is gonna be a direct result of the high pressure gases being compressed by the projectile rushing into that flow field created from the, the gases that were let out beforehand, those precursor gases. Most people really only consider that forward momentum but you have to understand that it's all coming back as well. So as those gas gases are coming out, they're gonna immediately try to turn that 90 degrees, but they can't because there's still a projectile in their way. There's still those competing gases in their way that are pushing against them as well. So what winds up happening is you can create an expansion fan. The precursor shock is still pushing on to anything that's coming out of the muzzle at this point. All of this occurs before the projectile is fully out. Finally, we get to hit the moment in which that projectile is able to uncork from the muzzle and suddenly there's all of this extra space for those high pressure gases to escape. They are no longer being plugged and constrained in. And since these are all still reacting and expanding, actually at a faster rate than the projectile is moving, 
they're gonna create your base shock. So as that propellant flow leaving the muzzle diminishes, then you'll finally get to see that smokestack type situation that we all, you know, like pew pew kind of thing. That's, that's really just the diminishing factor of whatever's left by and all of that other complicated moments leading up to it. But why do we care, right? Why does any of this matter? It's definitely a bit less important to the average person, but to people designing firearms, to people who are looking into designing muzzle devices, understanding this phenomena is going to allow you to better manage, mitigate, control that event. If you're watching this, I'd imagine you know what a muzzle device is. Pretty basic, right? They're largely used for three main reasons, right? Recoil reduction, flash suppression, and to decrease throughput. When we think of them, we can break it into two main categories. You have muzzle brakes and you have blast deflectors, which most of you are probably gonna think of as flash hiders. A lot of people, interestingly enough, are gonna actually think of the inception of muzzle devices with World War I, since there was a lot of increase in night operations, meaning that muzzle flash was much more obvious. So the need to be able to control and mitigate it had a huge rise, which is very true. But the first muzzle brake did actually come from France in 1842. So good job, frogs. You did a good one on firearms here. Um, there really wasn't any incentive at this point. Colonel de Beaulieu, Be Beaulieu, ha -ha. Yeah, he had a really rudimentary design at this point, something more akin to like drunk rednecks in their garage, but it did give a basis and allow us to refine that concept into the things that we have today. So thinking of muzzle brakes and blast effectors, they largely are the same principles, but we're gonna start with a focus on the previous, right? So there's two basic types of muzzle brakes. You have your closed and open systems. In a closed system, the exiting gas is gonna be channeled through fixed openings, and you'll usually see multiple baffles or ports. For an open system, however, though, there's only that one baffle, and conversely, it's able to direct gas flow to a much lesser extent. But usually the intent with these ones is recoil reduction, so that's not what's being mainly considered in design factors. Blast deflectors, on the other hand, your flash hiders, serve two main purposes, right? You wanna minimize the obscuration and to lessen the effect of muzzle blast within the vicinity of the firearm. So not only do I care about how I feel when I'm shooting, but I care about the guys next to me. So technically there are four types of these, but the duct type is honestly the redheaded stepchild of the group because of its size. Uh, I think this is more largely considered for things like artillery and the small cal world. We absolutely do not care. So we're gonna only talk about the three other types, which is baffled, perforated, and T-types. Baffle types, honestly, for all intents and purposes, are muzzle brakes. Fence the gases to the sides, right? The perforated ones or pepper pots are more of your like tubular structure. The number of holes is gonna be different, but I think five is a pretty generic go-to. And then the T-style ones are also a muzzle brake with, you guessed it, a T-type structure at the top. Any manufacturers can work towards mitigating muzzle flash through their own means of propellant additives and things like that. But unfortunately, those methods of mitigation are also going to increase smoke. So, we're more reliant on the additional attachments like muzzle brakes and such to control these events that happen. Since smoke is another area of concern, um, something we can talk about as well is the use of mechanical smoke suppressors, right? These work actually pretty simply, but they essentially they're able to rob the gas particulates of their momentum as they're coming down and out. So it's a tricky balance for engineers because you wanna make sure that the pores are large enough to not obstruct gas flow too much, but to still be able to capture these particulates. Um, in smoke suppressors, you can see uniform perforation in which there is zero attempt to control that flow. But then you also do have designs that have an increase in perforation density so that as you move closer towards the muzzle, 
that increase allows the particles to be spread more evenly in the device and kind of creates like a pressure drop in that axial direction. Again, all has to be a tricky balance because one solution is going to wind up impacting other effects. Muzzle brakes, we don't think of them as being able to suppress flash and that's largely not what they're considered for, for good reason. That secondary flash, interestingly enough, is often exacerbated with the use of a flash suppressor. So what winds up happening is that temperature of the propellant gas mixture, if it's high enough, the shock acts as an amplifying factor within that muzzle device. So someone had enough sense to observe the fact that muzzle brakes could wind up helping reduce flash, no one was considering them as flash reduction devices, but that observation allowed mechanical flash suppressors to be developed. You think of flash suppressors and you typically think of like your silencers, your simple silencers, or your bar style flash suppressors. Your final concern in regards to controlling and mitigating muzzle flow is going to be in regards to noise reduction. Thankfully, since noise is directly related to flash and blast, those other devices all largely do a pretty good job at noise reduction. Obviously, different things are going to do this better. You can think of brakes making things louder, but some of these other deflectors are able to help mitigate or at least redirect the sound so that it's not gonna be as boomy for the person right there. Realistically though, all of these devices that we talked about, um, the intent is just to control that muzzle flow in some way with varying, varying driving factors in mind. Not all created equal, some do this better than others. Some have different priorities in their design. So you might say like, hey, well, this one does make it louder. This one does make it flash more, but that's probably not design considerations when it was being done. And like I mentioned before, there's still actually a huge lack of understanding on this topic, which is partly why I find it to be so fascinating. I found this video topic to be fascinating. If you've made it to this point in the video, then hopefully you did too. But as always, thank you guys so much for watching. The next video won't be as much of a geek out. Hopefully I'll still see you guys there. Bye.